Ah, praise the Lord, everyone. Uh, beautiful um, morning here, and just thankful um, for what the Lord is, you know, uh, doing. Oh, well, we had a great time in camp, and uh, it was, what can I say, powerful, explosive, beautiful. You know, all at the same time, um, and uh, it was it was great. Um, and you know, if you didn't uh, get, you can get the um, you can get the card um, that allow you to listen it, to it online, and uh, especially. Services and Brother Painter's um, presentations that he made uh, will be, you know, will be an ex excellent help. So, um, and, you know, that is so important. Amen? Uh, I mean, there was some really great stuff that you get to hear. Actually, it's uh, Reed Sport that's doing it, and you can get the, uh, uh, if you want to get it, I can give a call to Brother Betterly and, um, you know, make that happen for you. So, all right. <laughs> all right. Uh, we're going to get started here, and we're continuing on the importance of morality and what it means to us and they and um, basically I'm, I'm going to say uh, you know we're going to look at here what it looks like you know we, we've talked about that some but I think um, it, it's best many times to uh, you know uh, under, understand the scripture on you know what it's trying to teach us. Okay, um, now many of us read the Old Testament when we're reading our Bible through, uh, which is you know uh, to me it's fun. I, I make it a little bit more fun because I'll, I'll read it in different versions. You know. I'll, Boom, boom, boom. Uh, for me, that um, uh, sometimes, you know, when you're reading through a lot of the lineages, uh, which you're not Jewish, but it's actually really important uh, because you're going to find some, uh, how can I say, very interesting tie ins from the past going up to the future. Um, and of course, we have the lineage of Jesus, you know, on both sides. So that's that's pretty cool. Um, and, uh, and and that's in the New Testament. But there's there's other things that you find uh, find out um, that certain people. And uh, how can I say uh, families that kept. Um, their integrity, you know, their their spiritual integrity, and you know, years later, you have something, or you or you have people that that came from, um, how can I say, um, some bad background, but changed that. Okay. And as we, you know, go into the future, and uh, a lot of times you'll, uh, uh, and, and what does that mean to us? Well, 
once we really start looking at all this stuff, you know, and it can be tedious. <laughs> Can be, uh, I don't mean, know, you want to see, I already pulled mine out, so <laughs> I can't pull it out anymore. It's too short. So, uh, you know, you want to, but there is, how can I say, there's a great uh, stories in this, uh, in that it's the grace of God. How can I say the kindness of God that will see, you know, even in these boring lineages, <laughs> okay? And so, uh, but if you read the Old Testament, you're going to read a lot of the horse the wall. And there's a lot of different things in there, okay? We have, uh, you know, what we have is ceremonial law. Okay. Does anybody know what ceremonial law is? Okay. In the Old Testament. Any idea? Ceremonial law. I mean, we put it in these categories. Okay. All right. Anybody want to go through it? Go ahead. Yes, yes, yeah. How they were to be conducted. The um, uh, another name for the uh, sermon law. Um, okay, includes the festivals. Okay, now ceremonial will will have to do also with how you offer sacrifice. Okay. Right? There's there's a certain way sacrifices grow. Okay. Um, Jesus and the church fulfills those laws. Did you know that? Okay. Jesus and the church fulfills those laws. So, you know, we don't concentrate so much on the ceremonial law. Okay? Even though uh, it's what I like to study because it tells us, it gives us detail of what God is planning to do. Okay? Um, in other words, um, you have symbolism in the Old Testament. Okay? Symbolism. Uh, well, let's, let's, uh, let me pull something out of here. Okay? Um, we have the lamb, the Passover lamb, that was to be offered without blemish. What's, does anybody understand what without blemish means? Yeah, it couldn't be lame or it couldn't be blind. It couldn't be any of those things. Right, right. You know, uh, it couldn't be, it couldn't have a mange or anything like that. You know, the animal had to be, and it was actually, you know, tested for all those things that Walter had said and, and looked at for all those things. Uh, before it was sacrificed. So it had to be a best. Now, when it's the best, it's the most expensive. <laughs> you know, um, see their livestock was there uh, most of the time uh, uh, was the kind of like cash, you know. Um, so there was, it was the most costly. And, and these are all important. It was without blemish. Okay, Jesus was without sin. 
okay? He didn't have the blemish of sin on him. He was the greatest sacrifice, okay? In other words, uh, this wasn't this wasn't something cheap. Okay. Oftentimes, when we, um, you know, when we give, uh, you know, where where are we giving in that mindset? So it has to do. Okay, it has to do with. You know, Jesus, you know, he gave his best, okay? He gave the last full measure. He gave everything, okay? All right? He died on the cross. Um, and not only that, he, he went through, uh, how can I say, um, a very painful, scourging, crucifixion um, you know uh, and scourging basically means he was you know beat with a whip and um, those catty nine tails that we see in the scripture uh, many times that they would have pieces of sharp metal in them or stone okay familiar with one of the, I mean it's not a single it's not a, just a single strand whip that we're used to seeing uh, in our culture uh, it was you know many strands that came out right and so you know when you're hit with that you're not hit with just one piece of metal at it time or something sharp like that in stone you are hit with several in one stroke so um, you know basically you know his uh, his back would have been pretty much shredded so um, you know 39 say one as King James would put it. And so this is the thing that he went through. So um, he is that sacrifice. So, you know, I could pull that out. And we see Jesus in Revelation as the Lamb. Okay. And uh, he is he is uh, described as the lamb. Okay. So you know, there's there's several things in the Old Testament that the Lord put down in the law was not just for the sea of people would obey, but was actually telling us a story. Okay. It was symbolic for what the Lord has done, what's happening in eternity, what's going to happen in the future. So within that, you have these ceremonial laws, and, and that's what makes them exciting to study. Okay? Um, it, it will, uh, how can I say it will give quality, okay, to what you know already. It'll give quality by studying. And then we have, okay, uh, what we have is the moral laws that uh, we see within in Scripture. They do not just include the the Ten Commandments. Okay? These are major commandments that will basically take care of all the others. 
Okay, we're to love the Lord our God with all our hearts. Okay? All right? This is, this is not something that's ended. Okay? We are to love the Lord. Okay? We are to love the Lord. What does it mean with all our hearts? In other words, we're, we're not halfway involved with God. We're fully committed. And we fully love Him. Okay? So now we're getting into the moral laws. Okay? And the second one is like the first. What's the second one? Anybody know? Love thy neighbor as thyself. You know, within these two commandments, Jesus said, it's the whole law. Within those two. Okay? I remember the story. You know, the, um, that, you know, rich young ruler that came, all right, you will find, you know, these commandments within them. But within those two commandments will basically be how it forms the rest. Okay, if you love somebody, you're not going to steal, right? Wrong with them. If you love the Lord, you're not going to steal what's his. Okay, God has given us things that belong to him. All right? Okay, things that belong to him. All right, so these are, these are important. Okay, for all of us. You with me? Okay. Um, you know, God blesses. All right. When uh, we understand that we need to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind. If we do this, okay. The rest of it's not going to be hard. Okay? You with me? Alright. Um, you gotta understand that God was providing for them back then. When this law was given, he had taken them out of Egypt, out of their slavery, okay, out of being beaten by the whip from the Egyptians, out of hard labor, okay. He has provided them miraculous, uh, just like miracle after miracle after miracle. The Lord provides. You know, how many people do you know have a personal cloud to get them through the desert? Okay? The whole company of Israel has a cloud. And if you've ever been in the desert, um, how many have ever been in the desert? A few of you had to be in Okay. Probably Joe. Yeah. How about the desert at night? It's dark. It's dark and it's cool. Okay. Um, my, uh, my uncle lived on the edge of the desert. Actually lived out. California, but he lived right.
right on the edge of the desert in an area that's called Pacoima. Okay? Now, it might be in the 90s or even 100 during the day, you know, three, three digits. But at night, it can go down to 50 degrees. Okay? So, the Lord provides a pillar of fire. Okay? Um, he turns up the heat. <laughs> He's got a furnace for them. So, when the Lord's given these things to them, and, you know, they cross, cross the Red Sea, they, they go on dry land, you know, all this stuff. They get thirsty and the Lord provides water. <coughs> um, and then manna. Okay. So the Lord's taken them through how can I say a rough area. But he is providing in the midst of it. Anybody else traveling through that desert is, you know, is not getting that treatment. You know what I'm saying? Right? God is there for them. You with me? He provides food and provision. Okay? They can take their livestock with them. All right? <clears throat> that, that to me is a, you know, you know, it's bad enough thinking about, you know, about two million plus people, okay? And now you've got livestock that's going along with you. You know, how about the carts that are being, uh, you know, that are being pulled along? Okay, maybe oxen. Um, I'm sure you would have certain beasts of burden carrying, like, you know, like the donkeys and stuff like that. They would, you know, they would be carrying things in the desert, and God's providing for all of that. Right? What a God. No other God can do that. Right. No other God in, in the, you know, in the annals of time has ever done that. Okay? You know, they all these, you know, all these other nations that were around that time, they, they would, you know, they would have um, carvings and stone and stuff like that. You know, saying their God's a provider, but you know, they ain't walking through a desert. <laughs> you know, they're living by rivers, and they're 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 you know, uh, you know, they're bringing the water in from the river by various ways. Okay, and and they're building trenches to uh, to get those water get the water you know to their Whatever they planted, you would. You get this? Yeah, and they're talking about how great their God is provider in these, um, how can I say it, these carvings that are in stone. Okay? And, uh, you know, that's basically what the images mean. But God's going beyond that. So for us to love God, we need to understand that he is a provider. Morality is easier to understand and do and be a part of when you realize that God cares for us. He's not just doing it to see what we're made of. He's doing it because he cares about our well-being. Okay? So, 
the morality is, is going to transcend, okay, or, or in other words, um, you know, what we see as, you know, don't do this, or do this, or don't do this, you know, something else, and blah, blah, blah. A lot of times we're, we're looking at the do's and the don'ts, and, you know, and that's all we see. But what we don't see a lot of times is what, you know, God's wisdom is in all this. Okay? All right? Uh, you hear me? Okay? And, and we're going to, you know, we're going to go um, back into some of these scriptures. Um, uh, if we can turn to 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter. Um, I, and we're going to look at um, some of the New Testament morality. I'm not going to go right now through some of the Old Testament. Um, I, I just want to hit on... Um, some New Testament, and then we'll get into some Old Testament and, and see how that... Now, here again, our New Testament writers are getting their morality from what Jesus had spoken and what was written in the Old Testament. You got that? So again, what's morality? It's basically, uh, it, it's conduct, a code of ethics that one lives by, okay? That, um, and and uh, it's, it's something, you know, everybody has uh, a concept of morality, but we have to do scriptural, God-centered morality. It will always surpass man's morality. Okay? And man is, man's morality is usually uh, situational. <laughs> okay? It's not very constant at all. Uh, <clears throat> and, all right, we're going to, um, uh, I'm going to start here, verse 1, and I'm going to go down through here, and of course, we're going to, of course, we read previously, um, verses 9 through 11 uh, in one of our other studies, but um, we're going to, uh, if you just follow along here, and I'm going to do it in the NLT, New Living Translation. Um, it says, when one of you has a dispute with another believer, how do you how dare you file a lawsuit and ask a secular court to decide the matter instead of taking it to other believers? Don't you realize that someday we believers will judge the world. And since you are going to judge the world, can't you decide even these little things among yourselves? Wow. Don't you realize that we will judge angels, 
So you should surely be able to resolve ordinary disputes in this life. If you have legal disputes about such matters, why go to the outside? Judges who are not uh, respected by the church. I am saying this to shame you. Isn't there anyone in all the church who is wise enough to decide these issues? Okay. <laughs> but instead, one believer sues another right in front of unbelievers. Even to have such lawsuits with one another is a defeat for you. Why not just accept the injustice and leave it at that? Why not let yourselves be cheated? Instead, you yourselves are the ones who do wrong uh, and cheat even your fellow believers. <laughs> Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or who commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or are abusive or cheap people none of these will inherit the kingdom of God okay and he goes on some of you were once like that but you were cleansed you were made holy you are made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Okay? Now, what verse 11 means in our day and what verse 11 meant in that day is two different things. In other words, it goes a little deeper than what we take it on the surface. All right? Um, I'll get back to that. Okay? You say I'm allowed to do anything but not everything is good for you. What? <laughs> and even though I am allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. <laughs> okay.
I say sexual sin habits. You know, one of them being pornography, another uh, being, um, how can I say, um, having sexual relations with somebody outside of the marriage. because we're going to read about it. Right? Still going on with the same subject. You know, you were once like that, but something cleansed you. Something changed you. So you're not to continue in that. Right? See, today, even within Christian churches, to say anything against, how can I say, having sex before marriage is just you know, too far over the top. Just way over the top. And therefore, in Christianity today, that is an accepted practice. And of course, now we're seeing all this, these other things that go along with homosexuality and transgender. Okay. So when that when how can I say opening the door to illicit relations before marriage. Okay? When that door is oh when that door was open, guess what else it opened? Okay. All right. You're going to have a flood come in. You hear what I'm saying? And so that's what we're facing today within our society here in America and across the world. All right. Uh, this is not just an American problem. Okay? This is something that's going on in Europe and uh, in many of the Asian countries. You hear what I'm saying? So, uh, what do we what do we think? these things. You know, verse 13, he gives an example of how far he's going to go. It says, you say food was made for the stomach and the stomach for food. This is true. Though, someday God will do away with both of them. But you can't say that our bodies were made um, for sexual immorality. They are made for the Lord. And the Lord cares about our bodies. Don't you think he knew that if we, you know, were involved in those activities, that there would be, you know, certain uh, diseases? Um, okay. We call them 
STDs today. All right? And it has made, it's made people sterile. It has killed people. Do you realize that back in this, in this country was, was, you know, trying to be settled by Europe and Europeans were coming over, that um, sassafras, you know sassafras that grows in the woods, uh, how many's ever taken it and made tea? Okay, I have. I was growing up, we used to take the fruits and then, you know, cut them up, dry them out. And I'll tell you what, you only take one sliver of <laughs> that stuff was potent, especially if you got it in the right time of year. You're supposed to do it in the fall. Okay, when the sap's going back down. And that's when it's the most, the root's most potent. Okay. Some of you probably don't even know what sassafras is. Okay. But how can I say um, STDs were so bad in that time in the 15 and the 1600s. Now listen to me. That one of the reasons why some of our first colonies over here settled where they did is because they were abundant in sassafras. Because sassafras in that day they believed was a cure for these diseases. So it was needed that bad. So you think that this hasn't been a problem for mankind? It's been a big problem. And the only reason they settled some of these colonies is just for sassafras. Stuff that we look at as weeds today. You know, what's that little tree? It don't get very big. Right? Right? What's that little tree? It's about the size, you know? All right? Walk through the woods, you know. If you're clearing, we just put it, we just put it down. Well, somebody knows what they're doing. What they're looking at is probably going to transplant that. Why? Because we know today that in the summertime, and did you ever hear down south sassafras tea? See, years ago out in the cotton fields, you know, it used to get pretty hot down there in those cotton fields. And they would come out with sassafras tea for the workers. Why? Because it thins the blood. It's a natural blood thinner. So, the worst thing that you want is your blood to be very thick in a hot sun. You're going to die. <laughs> okay. And so, um, it later on became uh, a tea of choice in the hot south. If you didn't know that, how many knew that? Okay, okay. Yeah, at least some lady. <laughs> What's that? So we used to go gather when I was a youngster. 
All right? And, you know, that's kind of stuff we used it for. Of course, we made a lot of hot tea with it. Okay. Sassafras tea. Okay. If you never tried it, you can, you, you can actually buy it in the store in tea bags now today. So, uh, a few of the stores will have sassafras on the shelf. Okay, so, and you can make a nice cold drink out of it. Okay, no caffeine. You don't want coffee, caffeine in the hot sun. Not good. That can kill you too. <laughs> never, <laughs> never drink caffeinated as a drink when you're working in the hot sun, your chest will begin to get tight. You'll start to feel faint. And that will be the end of you. If you survive, okay? <laughs> All right? Eight baby aspirins and a glass of sassafras tea, <laughs> and you will be fine. All right. So, okay. Teach them a little bit up. You know, I went off on a rabbit trail. But this immorality has always been a problem. It's not just something for our day. It's always been a problem. Stuff like this was happening in the past. And you thought, well, they, you know, they <coughs> dress certain ways and, you know, they had, had uh, you know, many of them had higher codes of conduct than what we do today. All right, when I mean higher codes, uh, you know, you uh, uh, gentlemen were to be gentlemen, ladies were to be ladies, and uh, there was definitely a division of the sexes in that respect, and, you know, they had, you know, their purposes, and both of them were important. That's why the gentleman would open the door for the lady. You hear what I'm saying? It wasn't because she was female. It is because she con conducted herself as a lady. You had to earn that status because there were women in those days who were barmaids. Guess what? That's what I'm a product of. A barmaid. And a religious guy. Yeah. All right. I'm part of the family that they wish not existed. Okay, so here's the thing. I'm not talking about my parents. I'm talking before that. It goes back to my great grandparents. All right, so here, here's the thing. Even though the place where they were raised, very religious. So what I'm trying to get across is that this is not something that comes without some effort. Right. 
You just don't think in your mind one of these days, I'm going to stay away from that. No, you, you have to make boundaries. You have to you have to create some uh, you know, how can I say someone you go to that you have uh, somebody kind of like checking in on you. Right. All right? And uh, husbands, your wife is good for that. That'll keep you out of trouble. If you don't have that, then you have to set up other boundaries. See, what does that look like? How do we stay away from something that is so volatile in human society? Why am I stressing this? I'm stressing this because it's a problem. Okay, it's a problem within the church. People will hardly bat an eye about this. But the Lord's, now what we just read tells us you're not going to have part of the kingdom of God if you practice this. In other words, you ain't going to lift one inch off the ground. So it's not, don't fool yourself if you continue in this, that that's something that's going to be okay. It's not going, it's not okay. And I'm not saying this to make, to, you know, make you feel condemned. I'm saying this, and the Lord knows it's the best thing for you, it's the best thing for your relationships. It, it's it's the best thing for all that. It it you know when there's when there's that uh, type of behavior within a marriage, it pulls. Okay, it pulls the couple apart. It's just the nature of the sin. It doesn't bring them together. It pulls them apart. And then in later in life, it becomes, how can I say, this extra baggage that you carry around because you did. And guess who's going to remind you all the time about it? It's not the Lord. It's going to be your own mind and Satan. Because they will work together to destroy you. Okay? That's why God said, listen, stay away from this. Because it will mess up one of the most sacred relationships that, that God created. Okay, we live in a world of abuse of this kind. It's it is rampant in our world, and uh, but it is it is the desire of the flesh.
It is not, okay, uh, it, it is not, the flesh isn't going to give up easily, my friend. And the enemy of our souls, okay, is out there to heighten the interest to catch our eyes, to catch our ears, to go in those directions. And, uh, you know, uh, I've, I've heard people, you know, say, I won't do this, but, you know, once it's done, it's, it's something that Unless there's a lot of hard work, it's going to come back on you again. You know, like a, you know, like a rabbit dog on a rabbit. Okay. My major had a rabbit dog and heard them hunt. You never had a rabbit dog and heard them hunt or do something else. They're fun. Okay. You know, they're out there. Oh. And they're running after that rabbit. And they're, they keep on doing that and sounding off to bring that rabbit around to you. And they stay far enough behind. It's a good rabbit dog so that you can shoot the rabbit and never Satan's wanting to do to you. You're the rabbit. And once he's gotten your scent, he ain't going to give up. Until he's destroyed you. And then he's going to enjoy licking your blood. You hear what I'm saying? I'm just, I'm just saying this to, to get across to you that the Lord is not giving us, us things to just, you know, these are suggestions. Okay, verse 15. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 6 chapter. Still with me here? I didn't lose you. Okay. And I'll be closing here shortly. It says, don't you realize that your bodies are actual parts of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is part of of Christ and join it to a prostitute? Never. And don't you realize that a man joins himself to a prostitute? He becomes one body with her? So I don't understand that. Well, you don't have to understand, but it's true. For the scriptures say, the two are united into one. But the person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Now verse 18, run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? 
You do not belong to yourself. For God bought. See what it says? Bought you with a what? It's a high price. No, I was talking about that. Man. Okay. So you must honor God with your body. Okay. Listen. You gotta honor God with your body. Alright? Let me say that again. We gotta honor God with our body. Let me say that again. We gotta honor God with our body. There's several things that we see in the Old Testament that give rise to what he is saying. Okay? And, you know, in Scripture, of course, it says don't commit adultery, fornication, all these kind of different things. But there's actually degrees of uh, penalties. And so, um, uh, in various ways. So, let's stand here. I'm just saying this um, So, well, I've heard this stuff before. I, yeah, you, you, you may have, and hopefully I can refresh some of this and bring it out, and, and hopefully in, that we can understand the importance uh, of uh, godly morality. That it's, that it's not, that it's, it's not an option. It's not just something the church says. It's what the scripture talks about.